So our next lecture, you know, we have another brand new set of lectures beginning today. This is Professor Fabrice Gerbier from LKB Laboratory, they call Normal, in Paris. And so he will tell us everything we wanted to know and never dare to ask this time about ultra-cold atoms. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, so, good morning to everyone. So I'd like to give you a few informations about this field of ultracold atoms. Uh, and my talks will be mostly given on an experimental perspective. Um, with basically um, an experimental motivation and uh, some illustration drawn from uh, recent experiments. Um, okay, so I will skip a bit uh, the historical part I put in the slides, uh, coming to this uh, presentation slide here, uh, which is trying to give a kind of panorama of what uh, people are doing with ultracold atoms today. Uh, and I've categorized into three main uh, items, let's say. Uh, where people are investigating these atoms. Uh, the most, uh, maybe most pursued one worldwide is the area of quantum degenerate cases, which I will uh, speak uh, at length in the, in the, for, in the following. Uh, but all, all the two other items are also very important. So one of them is the area of precision measurements. So coal atoms are nowadays used uh, in some of the most precise uh, measurements, for example, for time, uh, for gravitational uh, forces, and so on. Um, and so th those two areas are maybe where cold atoms can be important for the, the field of quantum technology, which this conference is about, uh, to, to perform very high precision measurements, at least in certain, of certain quantities, and to realize using degenerate cases and a number of tools that I will try to introduce uh, to simulate uh, many body systems of interest that are very hard to, to calculate uh, numerically. And the third item, which I will mention very briefly, is what I call here ultra cold chemistry, which is how to use these atoms basically as building blocks to, to build more complex systems, or so molecules essentially, uh, and to study how at the quantum level uh, molecules and chemical bonds uh, work out. Uh, so I will mostly focus on these two, actually mostly on this one, in the following. Um, and this slide here uh, summarizes basically the important length scale to sort of locate in the whole landscape of many body systems that people can access in experiments where uh, ultra-cold atomic gases are uh, special or specific. Uh, so one first uh, important remark is that in the, in the regime of temperature, or very low temperature where we work, basically um, you can speak of a quantum gas as opposed to a classical gas described by Maxwell Boltzmann statistics, uh, when the a typical length scale called the thermal de Ball wavelengths, which scales as a square root of, as a one of the square root of temperature. I uh, recall the expression here. So this length scale, when it becomes comparable or even larger than a typical uh, interparticle distance, n to the power one third, where n is a spatial density. Okay, so at, in, when this happens, basically within one coherent length, uh, this thermal wavelength, one atom will see some other atoms of the same species, and so quantum effect, such as indistinguishability, will play an important role. Okay, and so this is uh, summarized in this cartoon picture where as T goes down, you start from a classical gas where you can imagine each atom to be described as a point-like particle being statistic, uh, classical mechanics, sorry. And then as temperature goes down, so the boy wavelength increases. Uh, and at, at some point, uh, the, the, the boy wavelength uh, becomes comparable to the distance, typical average distance between two particles and quantum effects become manifest. And so in the case of bosons, as shown here, uh, they will condense uh, into the lowest particle ground state that is available to, 
to them. So this is purely a quantum, part, quantum mechanical effect, but it has nothing to do with the fact that atoms can also interact when they meet each other. And so this uh, is described by a parameter which is called the scattering length, A, and which very roughly you can think of as a 2A can be thought of as a diameter of hard sphere that are colliding against each other. Okay? So when the interparticle distance is comparable to this A here, you can imagine that this is a close packed system where basically when one atom moves, it immediately sees a neighbor or several. And so basically that's a system that you expect to behave like as a liquid or eventually as a solid depending on the parameters. But it's a system that people qualify as dense, so what people encounter in condensed kind of matter physics typically. So with atomic gases, we're in a completely opposite limit. Uh, where the scattering length is very short compared to the interparticle distance in most uh, situations. And so basically atoms fly around most of the time and once in a while they encounter another one which which they can interact. Okay? So mathematically you can have this uh, criterion to express this diluteness condition which is to the density times a to the power of three is much smaller than one. Okay? And so we have this hierarchy of length scale. Okay? A is the smallest one, the interparticle distance is intermediate, and the De Broglie wavelength is very large. So that tells us, the fact that the De Broglie wavelength is large tells us that the system uh, behaves as a coherent system, a coherent many-body system, and that you, you must describe its collective properties with quantum mechanics. And the fact that A is very short uh, tells you that the system is still dilute, meaning that there are a number of uh, theoretical approaches that you can use to describe it. Uh, which are not affordable in usual condensed matter systems or liquid helium or systems that are typically very dense. Okay? And I, I give you here a few numbers just to, to give a flavor. So a typical scattering length is a few nanometers length. Um, at the densities where you get uh, Bose-Einstein condensate or degenerate Fermi cases, the typical interparticle distance is on the order of 100 nanometers, and the De Broglie wavelength is at least one micrometer or even larger. All right, um, so now this hierarchy of scales uh, tells that um, also the system is dilute, still interactions are important because of the extremely low temperatures. And so indeed, uh, ultra cold atoms have been used to simulate or emulate a, a number of uh, many body systems. So it has uh, some well, uh, well uh, chosen characteristics to do this. First of all, there is a very large degree of tunability in the experiment. So we can, for example, change the trapping potential almost as well. Uh, and there are also ways to change the strength of interactions, even dynamically. We can tune the density, et cetera. Uh, and may, maybe most importantly, those systems they are held in ultra high vacuum by laser beams or magnetic traps. And so basically, they are very, very well isolated from the external world. Uh, and so you can forget about a lot of complications that typically arise in solid state systems, coupling with phonons, impurities, and so on. Or we can re eventually reintroduce them if you want to study it, but they don't come as a parasitic phenomenon when you want to focus on one particular uh, observable. Okay? So I give you here uh, three examples. The realization of BC was uh, basically the start of the whole field of degenerate quantum cases in 1995. Uh, and then two other landmark achievements were first the realization of the multi insulator, the transition from a superfluid to a multi insulator in a lattice gas. So I will discuss this in the, in the remainder, so in, at length. And I, I show here a last example, which is um, maybe the most uh, illustrative of, uh, of the power of, of, this, uh, of this approach, which is uh, the condensation of fermionic pairs but in a regime very far from the BCS regime that is encountered these uh, superconductors, uh, and where the interactions are essentially ex infinitely strong, the interaction between the fermions is essentially infinitely strong. And so this, this very strongly interacting thermonic pairs were observed to condense in several groups in the early 2000s. Uh, and it's still now, it's very, this uh, so-called unitary Fermi gas. Uh, it's still a very, very active field of research as a, a prototype of a very strongly interacting system. Okay, and there are also many other examples that I won't detail. So one of the goals would be to, through this example, uh, superfluid to multi insulator transition, to illustrate uh, the use of uh, ultra-cold atoms uh, to study such uh, many-body phenomenon. Okay, 
Ah, I did not mention, but of course you should feel free to ask questions at any time or interrupt uh, whenever you, you want to. Uh, okay, so you should recognize here the classical uh, periodic table of elements, uh, which I show uh, to, to illustrate what atoms really are used experimentally. So the blue frameworks, uh, frames, uh, are showing which atoms are used in degenerate gases experiments. And historically, the atoms on the first column, so alkali atoms, were used. But now an increasing number of species from the second column or from the lanthanide uh, series uh, are also uh, gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, and so each of these columns has different advantages. So alkali are the easiest in a general rule from an experimental point of view. Then you get uh, atoms with two electrons, which have very, very narrow optical lines, which can be used for various purposes. And lanthanides here have a very strong magnetic moments, so that those behave as dipole are particles with dipole, dipole interactions, so long range interactions. Uh, and so all these uh, different uh, properties are used in experiments to simulate uh, different quantum many body systems. Okay, uh, so this is, will be the plan that I would like to cover today. Uh, I will basically focus uh, on the on the, on the experimental point of view to introduce the essential techniques that we use to detect, trap, manipulate uh, degenerate gases. Uh, so, um, I will very briefly give an overview of how we use to actually arrive to a degenerate gas and then focus on what we do to, to get extract information from them, so through imaging, how we trap them with optical dipole traps and give a, a few notions uh, of what has been observed and studied with the Bose-Einstein condensate, in particular, their superfluid character. Okay, so starting with uh, basically the experimental path to obtaining in an experiment a degenerate uh, quantum gas, boson or fermions alike. Uh, so I plot it here a temperature scale. So here it's uh, room temperature is around here, and here you get it the, to, down to the nano Kelvin uh, temperature. So extremely close to absolute zero. Yeah. And uh, this scale here is meant to illustrate that a typical experiment will proceed in two steps. Okay? You will start well, from a, a room temperature vapor. Uh, for, for this picture, it's for sodium atoms. Uh, and then you will capture those atoms from this vapor into a so-called magneto optical trap using a relatively strong and close to resonant light. Okay? Uh, so this constitutes the first step, which is called here laser cooling, which I will not give too much details about. Uh, unless, uh, I, I only say that it, it basically involves what people call a magneto-optical trap, and this, uh, this allows to get to temperature of a few tenths of microkelvin, typically, starting from a room temperature vapor uh, in the beginning, okay? which is already quite impressive. But then it's not sufficient to, to reach uh, the condition for quantum degeneracy. And you have to supplement laser cooling with a second step uh, called evaporation or evaporative cooling, which is now proceeds in the absence of all resonant light as opposed to laser cooling. Uh, and it's a crucial step where you can get from this micro Kelvin or tens of micro Kelvin temperature down to the nano Kelvin range where typically you would get a BEC or degenerate Fermi gas as illustrated by this picture which I'm explaining in a moment. Okay, so just to get uh, a visual feeling, that's a picture of one of our experiments uh, in our lab. Uh, so this is uh, the optical table, and here you see a vacuum system, okay? So everything happens under ultra-high vacuum, um, where basically the, the behavior of the atoms follow linearly what I've uh, explained. So you, the atoms start here in an oven, which we heat to several hundred uh, degrees, and then from that oven emerge a beam of atoms which uh, we can see here in that picture. This is uh, this blue line here. is material is the uh, photons that are emitted by the atomic beam as it crosses uh, the vacuum system. And then everything ends up uh, in, in a metal chamber over there. Uh, you, this uh, green now uh, cloud is a cloud of atoms, which is also emitting photons, which we pick up with the camera. Uh, and this is a different wavelength uh, and a different color. And in this chamber, you get a, a cloud of laser-cooled atoms at a few tens of microkelvins. Okay? Uh, so 
this, uh, this is a picture of the same experiment at a later stage, just to show that uh, the optical table is pretty busy and that this experiment quickly become relatively complex uh, and complicated to, to handle. Uh, so, now a bit uh, in more details. Uh, why do we have to do this sequence in two steps? Why do we have to do laser cooling first and then evaporative cooling? Okay, so the goal, uh, this is the same condition that stated before, but now uh, I rephrase it in terms of the so-called phase space density, D, uh, the product of the density of the particles times uh, the cube of the De Broglie wavelength, okay? So it tells you basically uh, how many particles you get inside of a, a coherence volume for a single atom. If it's less than one, then basically you can neglect one of the effects and you can treat the system as a, as a Maxwell-Boltzmann gas, okay? And now if it's bigger than one, then you cannot neglect quantum effects anymore and you reach a quantum gas regime. Okay, so the reason why the first step here, laser cooling, is insufficient is that you have to use, in order to perform this step, a laser which is near resonant, okay? And near resonant means you get atoms, photons that are absorbed by the atoms and then re-emitted mostly through spontaneous emission. Now, spontaneous emission is essential because it provides a necessary dissipative mechanism that allows you to cool the emotional degrees of freedom of your atoms and to reach uh, the, the temperature of a few tens of micro kelvins. Okay? But the issue is that it's also intrinsically random. So you cannot uh, control the direction in which uh, spontaneous photons will be emitted. Okay? And this randomness actually puts a limit to the temperature that you can achieve. Uh, and prevents to cool the atoms to uh, below certain limiting temperatures, okay? Which... So that's one limit as well, but here now it's really, it will work with a single atom. It actually works with a single ion, for example, which uh, have the same uh, type of mechanism. And it's really the fact that uh, the spontaneous emission has a, well, has a random direction, okay? And that leads to a momentum space, a random walk in momentum space, okay? You get random momentum kicks uh, in, in any directions, which on average makes zero, but will increase the dispersion of the atomic momentum, okay? And this is balanced by the cooling force, and so that comes to, a, like in Einstein's relation, it comes to an equilibrium at a certain uh, limit temperature. And those temperatures are typically on the order of tens of micro kelvins with densities in that range, meaning that the phase space density after this uh, cooling stage is very small, typically 10 to the minus five, okay? So we're still very, very far from a quantum generated regime. And so to overcome these limitations uh, due to laser cooling, we make use of this second step, which is evaporative cooling in a conservative trap. So conservative means we get rid of all spontaneous emission, which has this advert effect of uh, limiting the temperature. So we still use light, but we detune it very far. We use a frequency which is very, very far from any atomic resonance, okay? So what people call conservative traps, typically, uh, can be also used uh, in magnetic traps. And then we proceed with evaporative, uh, so-called evaporative cooling technique, which I will uh, say a word of uh, in the following uh, talk. Okay, do we have questions uh, at this stage? No, I will not actually, but I will describe optical traps uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, magnetic traps, well, optical traps are more, uh, they are more used now. Magnetic traps were used historically, but they tend to be replaced more and more with optical traps, so that's why I will focus on. Um, and okay, actually to focus on that and also to discuss uh, well, another important topic, which is how we extract information from such cases. Uh, I need to make uh, a few reminders about the interaction of uh, an atom uh, with light, uh, resonant or not resonant, okay? And so, typically, we tend to ignore, uh, at least at the first level of approximation, the internal structure of the atom and just model it as a two-level system, okay, with a ground state. Oops, I'm sorry. Back too much. So there is, with the ground state, where the atoms normally are, and then some excited state connected with light, and so atoms can absorb a photon from, from some laser that you shine onto the sample, uh, and get promoted this excited state. Uh, in general, the laser doesn't have to be strictly resonant, so the frequency omega L of the laser is offset by a quantity delta L, which is called the detuning, 
from the exact resonance, okay? Uh, and I call also gamma the width or the one over gamma is the lifetime, the radiative lifetime of this excited state up there, okay? Uh, so now taking the limit of low light intensity, uh, so basically you look at weak response, uh, but you can see this problem as the driving of a system which possibly has an electric dipole moment uh, by some electric field uh, corresponding to the, the electromagnetic field uh, of the laser, okay? Uh, and so for low enough intensity, then the electric dipole moment of the atoms, which can be excited in this transition, will basically respond linearly to the electric field, okay? And so you can describe this in terms of the average dipole moment by a susceptibility, chi, uh, such as the average dipole moment is proportional to the incident electric field times uh, the susceptibility, okay? So that's standard linear response. And as usual, the susceptibility is a complex quantity, uh, and it, its real part is related to the component of the dipole, of the mean dipole, that oscillates in phase with the exciting field, whereas the imaginary part is related to the component that oscillates out of phase with the exciting field, okay? And so I've plotted here the real part and imaginary part, and so we may recognize the dispersive shape of the real part, okay? which is uh, very common in this, in this type of problems. So it's zero exactly on resonance, and then changes side across it, uh, while the imaginary part now is maximal around the resonance, okay? And falls off as a Lorentzian uh, uh, for larger detuning, or when the frequency omega L gets away from the exact resonance, all right? So now uh, I'm going to, to use this, uh, this uh, notions for two things. First, to explain how we image the atomic gases, you know, to extract information, okay? And so this is a sketch of a, of a typical setup. So this would be the cloud of atoms, which is uh, held in a dry vacuum. And we, to extract information from it, we shine some laser lights onto it. Um, and then through some imaging system, we cast the image of this uh, cloud onto a, a CCD camera, okay? Huh? Yeah. Ah, uh, well, because you can move either this camera or that lens, and then when you move it, at some point your image gets sharper and sharper, and then, well, the sharp, when you find the sharpest point, you know that exactly when you focus your camera, or, so it's the same trick. Uh, and transversely, it doesn't matter. And transversely, typically, the width here is much, much bigger than the size of the cloud. So what you only need to know is whether this is making an accurate image on, the, on this camera. So you need to make sure that this plane, basically, and that plane where the atoms sit are conjugate in, a, in the optical uh, sense. Yes. OK. And so to describe uh, what's happening to this light beam that's, that's going through, you can essentially describe the, the atomic gas as a dielectric medium. So we saw that when you send light, dipole, the atomic dipoles get excited. So what that means is that if the density uh, is n at, then in this uh, cloud here, there will be an electric polar polarization, P, uh, which is simply given by the mean dipole times the, the density of atoms. Okay, so that gives you the density of, uh, of uh, polarization. Okay, and now, this uh, polarization will affect propagation of light through the usual Maxwell equation, uh, or Helmholtz actually equation, which I remind here, appropriate from a dielectric media. So it means that uh, this equation here, you can turn into uh, an equation relating the polariz electric polarization P to the electric field E with a proportionality coefficient, which is epsilon uh, zero, so the electric susceptibility of vacuum, times the susceptibility we have just introduced for the electric dipole, atomic electric dipole, okay? Uh, so now, to treat this type of equation, what people normally do is to assume that the E has a fast varying term, which is a traveling wave component, exponential IKLZ, and then a slowly varying component in terms of its modulus, E, N of the phase phi L, okay? Uh, so from the Maxwell equation, you can turn this into 
uh, an equation for the propagation of the amplitude, E, uh, and for the phase as a function of Z. Okay? And you will notice that this is a second order equation where those are first order. Uh, and the reason is that under the approximation that E and phi L vary slowly on the scale of a wavelength, uh, then you can simplify this uh, equation by neglecting their Laplacian, basically. So this is what's normally called the slowly varying envelope approximation in optics. Okay? So now I will be mostly interested in the first of this equation, or for the two can be, can be used to, to perform imaging. And when recast in terms of the intensity of the laser, so basically proportional to the square of the electric field, this gives you what's called as, what's known as uh, the low, Beer-Lambert law, which is very well known in chemistry, for example, which tells you that the derivative of the intensity over the zine, so the variation of, intensi of light intensity as it propagates through the sample, uh, decays with the intensity, uh, with some proportionality constant, kappa, which we can relate to the imaginary part of the susceptibility, psi second, uh, that we saw before. Okay? Uh, and so what that means uh, is that when you look at the intensity which is transmitted, uh, what you will see is something which is uh, proportional to the incoming intensity times a transmission factor that depends exponentially on the integral of the atomic density along the propagation direction, okay? what people call the column density, typically. Uh, with a proportionality factor that you can interpret as, a, as an absorption cross-section. All right, but the, its exact value is not uh, very important. What matters is that uh, if I now uh, reverse this equation, I get a formula for this column density, which is the log of the incident intensity divided by the transmitted intensity once the atoms are present. Okay, so that's exactly what the formula we are using in an experiment to extract uh, uh, this, uh, the density that is actually realized, okay? We measure the incoming intensity, we measure the transmitted intensity, and then we apply this formula to extract uh, a map of the atomic density through the sample. Okay. Well, actually what we do, we make a first an image with the atoms present, that gives us ET, and then we push the atom away, just measure the same uh, incoming, but without transmission this time, so we actually measure both in succession. Okay. And so that gives you a, an image like this, um, and that, uh, that image will basically give you a map of the density distribution of the atoms uh, prior to, to sending the, uh, the light that is used for, for obtaining this image. Okay. Ah, yes, sorry. Uh, so that's, I think, my, uh, magneto optical trap, this, this thing, okay? Uh, and so one thing that is uh, usually done, uh, and which is typically important, is that we are not doing this type of measurements while the atoms are trapped. So what we do is, uh, you, what we usually do, uh, is to perform what's called time of flight imaging, which basically means that we release the atoms from the trap where they are held, and then we let them expand in free flight for some period, typically milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. Uh, and at this stage, after it has expanded, we take an image of the atomic cloud, okay? So why do we need to, to do this? Uh, why do we need to, to expand before doing this image? The reason is that often, um, this low intensity picture that I was uh, describing before does not apply for a cloud that is uh, trapped. Uh, the cloud is too dense, and there is a very high probability that if one atom emits a photon, it will be picked up by another one, uh, leading to a lo lot of complication, multiple scattering, etc. So all these effects are not included into the beer lambert law I've, uh, I've been showing before. Uh, and so therefore, the method cannot be applied if the density, the spatial density is too high, okay? So the primary reason for doing this is to reduce the particle density, to put the system in a regime where uh, we can apply the, the, the method that I've outlined before, okay? Uh, so now, an important part is that why do we this, uh, doing this time of flight sequence where we switch off the trap suddenly at T and then let the cloud expand for some time. What we get at the end uh, is an image, not of the spatial distribution, 
but of the momentum initial momentum distribution of the particles. Okay, so it's it's an exact uh, result if you can neglect interactions, uh, and it's uh, approximate only when you have interactions, but it's still very useful. Okay, so I've I've put this in a set of uh, problems which are available on the website, I believe uh, under the lecture four, and so this is a, there are solutions as well. So. It's relatively easy to follow. But this is one of the first uh, where uh, I advise to, to try to, to at least look at the problem to understand how this comes out. But I will use this result a lot. Basically, that for a time of flight experiment, uh, the atomic density that you record on your camera is basically an image up to some scale factor of the initial momentum distribution of the gas. Okay? Uh, and uh, a side. Uh, a side effect, sort of, of this, uh, of this formula is that now when you look at the radius of the cloud, it will correspond to the radius of the momentum distribution um, of the initial gas. Okay? So what that means is that if you are in a high temperature regime, basically the radius of the, for example, in the, for Maxwell-Boltzmann gas, the radius of the momentum distribution is simply related to the temperature of the gas through equipartition. Okay? So that's actually the, the means to extract the temperature of the cloud uh, and, and to, to, to assess it. Okay? So it, it, it's slightly different when you get into the generate gases, both are Fermi, but roughly the idea is the same. You look at the time of flight, that gives you a momentum picture, and you look at the momentum radius of your system. Okay, um, so now I've, I've, uh, I've explained uh, how we extract information from, uh, from, from the gas, uh, and now I'm going to explain how the same mechanism, basically excitation of a, of a dipole, can be used to actually trap the atoms. Okay, so that's the mechanism behind the so-called optical dipole traps, or sometimes a bit longer far-off resonance optical dipole traps. And so now, basically, the idea is still the same. Huh? So you send a laser, very far off resonance. So it will still excite uh, an atomic dipole proportional to the electric field, E. Okay? And now this dipole will have some potential energy inside the exciting field. Okay? Uh, and so it's an induced dipole, but uh, so there is this extra factor of one half here. But otherwise, the potential energy will be simply minus one half d scalar e, and the average here is meant to make a time average over one optical period to just look at the, uh, at the well, average uh, energy, potential energy felt by, by the, the dipole. Okay? And so this is a standard formula from uh, electromagnetism. But when you use the expression for the susceptibility that, uh, that is obtained uh, before, you get a formula where the energy depends on the intensity, on the square of the electric field, uh, which is proportional to the intensity, on the dipole matrix element squared, and inversely proportional to the detuning in the limit where the detuning is very large. Okay? So now, if uh, the intensity is uh, uniform, this gives you, uh, if you have a plane wave, this would give you a uniform shift. But in, in reality, we never work with plane wave. So, Laser, the intensity profile of the lasers that we use always depend on space, which means that the potential energy will also depend on space, and that can be used to, to trap the atoms in some potential minimum. So whether a potential minimum occurs depends on this detuning here. So if detuning, so I remind that the detuning is a difference between the laser and the resonance frequency. So when it's negative, with the so-called red detuned case, then basically this potential is attractive and you attract atom to the maxima of the intensity. Okay? On the other hand, when it's positive, the so-called blue detuned case, then you expel atoms from the maxima of intensity. Okay? So both can be used, and both have been used uh, in different cases. I will focus on the red detuned case in the, in the remainder, so that atoms will be attracted to the intensity maxima. And now, uh, just to justify the, the fact that we call this a conservative trap, that dissipation is not important, you can calculate, uh, so the dipole is excited uh, in a time dependent fashion, and you can calculate also using the standard electromagnetism formula how much energy it radiates uh, averaged over an optical period. So this is called W dot here. Uh, and you, this, uh, the rate of radiation, energy radiation, is simply the spontaneous emission rate, the rate at which atoms 
can re-emit photons by, after being excited of resonancy times the energy of a photon, H bar omega L. Okay? And so that can also be interpreted as the energy absorbed by the dipole from the excitation field and then re-radiated uh, inelastically, if you want. Okay? And so usually, delta is big enough Ah, I should mention that the, the spontaneous emission height, using the same formula for the, for the susceptibility, north k, that's 1 over delta squared, okay, as opposed to 1 over delta for the potential. So if delta is big enough, you can make it such that the spontaneous emission height and the heating height associated with it is negligible, while the potential energy is substantial. Okay? And so this is why uh, the name of a conservative trap, a dis trap without dissipation, is well justified. Uh, so th this slide now shows uh, an example of uh, what is done experimentally. So here you have a Gaussian uh, laser beam, which is what most laser beams look like in, uh, in practice. Uh, so it's, uh, it comes to focus here around z equal to zero, and then diverges due to diffraction away from focus. Okay? So that, that leads to a potential which has a complicated form like this, which is depending in a Gaussian fashion on the transverse coordinate and with a Lorentzian dependence on the axial coordinate z, okay? Uh, so here, the thing to notice is that typically, uh, the size w of the beam in the transverse plane is very large compared to one wavelength. And that means that the Rayleigh range, giving the range of variation along the axis, is very large as well compared to w. Uh, so when you translate this into near the minimum, near the focus here, into trap frequencies, expanding this potential in terms of the coordinate, you will get an almost harmonic potential, okay, with trap frequency which will be strong in the transverse, uh, the coordinate transverse to the beam propagation axis, but very, very weak along the beam propagation axis, okay? So uh, summarized by this condition that omega x here is very large compared to omega z. And so typical numbers uh, will give you that uh, this, the frequency along x can easily be kilohertz or several kilohertz, whereas on axis it's only a few hertz. So this trapping potential can be very anisotropic. Okay? Uh, and the last thing I want to, to mention is, uh, so this potential depth here, U0, will basically give you the maximal energy over which, uh, below which you can trap atoms. Sorry. Uh, and if, atom, if an atom has a higher energy, it will just escape from the trap and be lost uh, for all experiments, okay? So this is typically on the order of one millikelvin in temperature scale, and which explain why we still need to have this first step in the two-step sequence I was mentioning before, uh, in order to, to trap uh, efficiently atoms in this kind of dipole trap, you already require uh, cold enough uh, sample. You cannot trap any meaningful sample just starting from a room temperature uh, vapor, okay? So basically the first step is, is, is always needed in order to efficiently load this kind of trap. And the same applies also to magnetic trap, which I will not discuss too much. Okay, so that, this gives you um, well, it's the same experiment as before. This is a cartoon sketch of it. Um, and that, that shows um, how the thing uh, is working in, in practice. So this is a view from the side. Uh, and what you see here is the same magneto-optical trap as before, which is falling after it has been released because of gravity. And then here on top, oops, I'm sorry. You see this line of atoms here, which corresponds to a fraction of, the, of these atoms that were in this trap originally, that have been catched in an optical dipole trap propagating horizontally like this, okay? Uh, and then, because as I've mentioned, the trapping along this axis is very weak, you see that this has a very anisotropic shape, looks like a needle, and so often it's very useful to, instead of using only one such trap, to cross them like this, so that you get uh, atoms which are trapped in both arms. And as you cool the sample, shown by this plot, progressively atoms from, are basically emptied from the arms as the sample gets colder and colder and uh, accumulate in the crossing region where they see a dense trap, uh, strong trapping in all three directions, okay? Uh, and so that's typically uh, how you arrived at, uh, at Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, so I'm showing here uh, absorption images, also taken from the same experiment, where temperature decreases from the left to right. Uh, and this, this shows the typical signature 
for bosons of the appearance of a boson chain condensate in the, in the system. Uh, so you, you start from a high temperature, relatively high temperature, where the, the cloud has a Gaussian shape uh, and with relatively broad uh, size. This is again after time of flight. Uh, and then as you cool down the sample, you see a dense peak here appearing in the center of the distribution uh, and progressively uh, becoming more populated while the background is progressively exhausted. Okay? And so at the end, this, this corresponds to a nearly pure uh, Bose-Einstein condensate. So all atoms uh, condensing into, or uh, populating this very narrow peak, which means that uh, almost all atoms have near zero uh, momentum. Huh? Uh, and then the background of thermal atoms being almost vanishing in the limit of, the, of very low temperatures, okay? So that's uh, the hallmark of Bose-Einstein condensation, as is described uh, in statistical mechanics uh, textbooks. Uh, you, in the box, you expect that atoms will accumulate into the k equal zero momentum state as temperature is decreased below the temperature for condensation. So that's qualitatively similar. Uh, you can take into account the harmonic trap. You also find that it's qualitatively similar. But for quantitative agreement, it is impossible to neglect uh, the fact that atoms interact, as I've sketched before. And so as soon as the condensate is formed, interaction between these atoms becomes important, and it's necessary to, to include them in the description to understand the properties of uh, quantum gases. Okay? Uh, but I think uh, I will probably leave that for the next uh, talk. Okay? Uh, and stop here for today, thanking you for your attention. Thank you.